The Loves of Alonzo Fitzclarence and Rosanna Ethelton by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Letton. The Loves of Alonzo Fitzclarence and Rosanna Ethelton by Mark Twain. It was well along in the forenoon of a bitter winter's day. The town of Eastport in the state of Maine lay buried under a deep snow that was newly fallen. The customary bustle in the streets was wanting. One could look long distances down them and see nothing but a dead-white emptiness with silence to match. Of course, I do not mean that you could see the silence. No, you could only hear it. The sidewalks were merely long, deep ditches with steep snow walls on either side. Here and there you might hear the faint, far scrape of a wooden shovel and if you were quick enough you might catch a glimpse of a distant black figure stooping and disappearing in one of those ditches, and reappearing the next moment with a motion which you would know meant the heaving out of a shovel full of snow. But you needed to be quick, for that black figure would not linger, but would soon drop that shovel and scud for the house, thrashing itself with its arms to warm them. Yes, it was too venomously cold for snow shovelers, or anybody else to stay out long. Presently the sky darkened. Then the wind rose and began to blow in fitful, vigorous gusts, which sent clouds of powdery snow aloft and straight ahead and everywhere. Under the impulse of one of these gusts, great white drifts banked themselves like graves across the streets. A moment later another gust shifted them around the other way, driving a fine spray of snow from their sharp crests, as the gale drives the spume flakes from wave crests at sea. A third gust swept that place as clean as your hand, if it saw fit. This was fooling, this was play, but each and all of the gusts dumped some snow into the sidewalk ditches, for that was business. Alonzo Fitzclarence was sitting in his snug and elegant little parlor, in a lovely blue silk dressing gown, with cuffs and facings of crimson satin, elaborately quilted. The remains of his breakfast were before him, and the dainty and costly little table surface added a harmonious charm to the grace, beauty, and richness of the fixed appointments of the room. A cheery fire was blazing on the hearth. A furious gust of wind shook the windows, and a great wave of snow washed against them with a drenching sound, so to speak. The handsome young bachelor murmured, "'That means no going out to-day. Well, I am content. But what to do for company? Mother is well enough. Aunt Susan is well enough.' But these, like the poor, I have with me always. On so grim a day as this, one needs a new interest, a fresh element to whet the dull edge of captivity. That was neatly said, but it doesn't mean anything. One doesn't want the edge of captivity sharpened up, you know, but just the reverse. He glanced at his pretty French mantel clock. That clock's wrong again. That clock hardly ever knows what time it is, and when it does know, it lies about it which amounts to the same thing. Alfred! There was no answer. Alfred! Good servant, but as uncertain as the clock. Alonzo touched an electric bell button in the wall. He waited a moment, then touched it again, waited a few moments more, and said, Battery out of order, no doubt. But now that I have started, I will find out what time it is. He stepped to a speaking tube in the wall, blew its whistle, and called, Mother! and repeated it twice. "'Well, that's no use. Mother's battery is out of order, too. Can't raise anybody downstairs, that is plain.' He sat down at a rosewood desk, leaned his chin on the left-hand edge of it, and spoke as if to the floor. "'Aunt Susan?' A low, pleasant voice answered. "'Is that you, Alonzo?' "'Yes. I'm too lazy and comfortable to go downstairs. I am in extremity, and I can't seem to scare up any help. Dear me, what is the matter?' "'Matter enough, I can tell you. "'Oh, don't keep me in suspense, dear. "'What is it? "'I want to know what time it is. "'You abominable boy! "'What a turn you did give me! "'Is that all?' "'All? "'On my honour? "'Calm yourself. "'Tell me the time and receive my blessing. "'Just five minutes after nine. "'No charge. "'Keep your blessing. "'Thanks. "'It wouldn't have impoverished me, Auntie, "'nor so enriched you that you could live without other means.' "'He got up murmuring. "'Just five minutes after nine, and faced his clock. "'Ah,' said he, "'you are doing better than usual. "'You are only thirty-four minutes wrong. "'Let me see, let me see. Thirty-three and twenty-one are fifty-four. Four times fifty-four are two hundred and thirty-six. "'One off leaves two hundred and thirty-five. "'That's right.' 
He turned the hands of his clock forward till they marked twenty-five minutes to one, and said, "'Now see if you can't keep right for a while, else I'll raffle you.' He sat down at the desk again and said, "'Aunt Susan?' "'Yes, dear.' "'Had breakfast?' "'Yes, indeed, an hour ago. "'Busy?' "'No, except sewing. Why?' "'Got any company?' "'No, but I expect some at half-past nine. "'I wish I did. I'm lonesome. I want to talk to somebody.' "'Very well. Talk to me. But this is very private.' "'Don't be afraid. Talk right along. There's nobody here but me. "'I hardly know whether to venture or not, but—' "'But what? Oh, don't stop there. You know you can trust me, Alonzo. You know you can. "'I feel it, Aunt, but this is very serious. It affects me deeply. "'Me and all the family, even the whole community. "'Oh, Alonzo, tell me. I will never breathe a word of it. What is it? "'Aunt, if I might dare—' "'Oh, please, go on. I love you and feel for you. Tell me all. Confide in me. What is it?' "'The weather!' "'Plague take the weather. I don't see how you can have the heart to serve me so long. "'There, there, auntie, dear, I'm sorry. I am, on my honor. I won't do it again. Do you forgive me?' "'Yes, since you seem so sincere about it, though I know I oughtn't to. You will fool me again as soon as I have forgotten this time.' "'No, I won't. Honor bright. But such weather, oh, such weather! You've got to keep your spirits up artificially. It is snowy and blowy and gusty and bitter cold.' "'How is the weather with you?' "'Warm and rainy and melancholy. "'The mourners go about the streets "'with their umbrellas running streams "'from the end of every whalebone. "'There's an elevated double pavement of umbrellas "'stretching down the sides of the streets "'as far as I can see. "'I've got a fire for cheerfulness, "'and the windows open to keep cool. "'But it is vain. "'It is useless. "'Nothing comes in but the balmy breath of December.' with its burden of mocking odors from the flowers that possess the realm outside, and rejoice in their lawless profusion, whilst the spirit of man is low, and flaunt their gaudy splendors in his face, while his soul is clothed in sackcloth and ashes, and his heart breaketh. Alonzo opened his lips to say, You ought to print that and get it framed, but checked himself, for he heard his aunt speaking to someone else. He went and stood at the window and looked out upon the wintry prospect, the storm was driving the snow before it more furiously than ever. Window shutters were slamming and banging. A forlorn dog, with bowed head and tail withdrawn from service, was pressing his quaking body against a windward wall for shelter and protection. A young girl was ploughing knee-deep through the drifts, with her face turned from the blast, and the cape of her waterproof blowing straight rearward over her head. Alonzo shuddered and said with a sigh, "'Better the slop than the sultry rain, and even the insolent flowers than this.' He turned from the window, moved a step, and stopped in a listening attitude. The faint, sweet notes of a familiar song caught his ear. He remained there with his head unconsciously bent forward, drinking in the melody, stirring neither hand nor foot, hardly breathing. There was a blemish in the execution of the song, but to Alonzo it seemed an added charm instead of a defect. The blemish consisted of a marked flatting of the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh notes of the refrain, or chorus of the piece. When the music ended, Alonzo drew a deep breath and said, "'Ah, I have never heard in the sweet by-and-by sung like that before.' He stepped quickly to the desk, listened a moment, and said in a guarded, confidential voice, "'Auntie, who is this divine singer?' "'She is the company I was expecting. Stays with me a month or two. I will introduce you. Miss, for goodness sake, wait a moment, Aunt Susan. You never stop to think what you are about.' He flew to his bedchamber and returned in a moment perceptibly changed in his outward appearance, and remarking snappishly, "'Hang it! She would have introduced me to this angel in that sky-blue dressing-gown with red-hot lapels. Women never think when they get a-going.' He hastened and stood by the desk, and said eagerly, "'Now, Auntie, I am ready,' and fell to smiling and bowing, with all the persuasiveness and elegance that were in him. "'Very well. Miss Rosanna Ethelton, let me introduce you to my favorite nephew.' "'Mr. Alonzo Fitzclarence. "'There. You are both good people, and I like you, "'so I am going to trust you together "'while I attend to a few household affairs. "'Sit down, Rosanna. Sit down, Alonzo. "'Good-bye. I shan't be gone long.' "'Alonzo had been bowing and smiling all the while, "'and motioning imaginary young ladies "'to sit down in imaginary chairs, "'but now he took a seat himself, mentally saying, "'Ah, oh, this is luck. 
Let the winds blow now, and the snow drive, and the heavens frown, little I care. While these young people chat themselves into an acquaintanceship, let us take the liberty of inspecting the sweeter and fairer of the two. She sat alone, at her graceful ease, in a richly furnished apartment, which was manifestly the private parlor of a refined and sensible lady, if signs and symbols may go for anything. For instance, by a low, comfortable chair stood a dainty, top-heavy workstand, whose summit was a fancifully embroidered, shallow basket, with vari-colored crewels and other strings and odds and ends protruding from under the gaping lid and hanging down in negligent profusion. On the floor lay bright shreds of turkey red, Prussian blue and kindred fabrics, bits of ribbon, a spool or two, a pair of scissors, and a roll or so of tinted silken stuffs. On a luxurious sofa, upholstered with some sort of soft Indian goods wrought in black and gold threads, interwebbed with other threads not so pronounced in color, lay a great square of coarse white stuff, upon whose surface a rich bouquet of flowers was growing, under the deft cultivation of the crochet needle. The household cat was asleep on this work of art. In a bay window stood an easel with an unfinished picture on it, and a palette and brushes on a chair beside it. There were books everywhere, Robertson's Sermons, Tennyson, Moody and Sankey, Hawthorne, Rab and his friends, cookbooks, prayer books, pattern books, and books about all kinds of odious and exasperating pottery, of course. There was a piano, with a deckload of music and more in a tender. There was a great plenty of pictures on the walls, on the shelves of the mantelpiece, and around generally. Where coins of vantage offered were statuettes, and quaint and pretty gimcracks, and rare and costly specimens of particularly devilish china. The bay window gave upon a garden that was ablaze with foreign and domestic flowers and flowering shrubs. But the sweet young girl was the daintiest thing these premises, within or without, could offer for contemplation, delicately chiseled features of Grecian caste, her complexion the pure snow of a japonica that is receiving a faint reflected enrichment from some scarlet neighbor of the garden, great soft blue eyes, fringed with long curving lashes, an expression made up of the trustfulness of a child and the gentleness of a fawn, a beautiful head crowned with its own prodigal gold, a lithe and rounded figure whose every attitude and movement was instinct with native grace. Her dress and adornment were marked by that exquisite harmony that can come only of a fine natural taste perfected by culture. Her gown was of a simple magenta tulle, cut bias, traversed by three rows of light blue flounces, with the salvage edges turned up with ashes of roses chenille, overdress of dark bay tarlatan, with scarlet satin lambrequins, corn-colored polonaise, enzanye, looped with mother-of-pearl buttons and silver cord, and hauled aft and made fast by buff velvet lashings, basque of lavender reps, picked out with Valencians, low neck, short sleeves, maroon velvet necktie, edged with delicate pink silk, inside handkerchief of some simple three-ply ingrain fabric of a soft saffron tint, coral bracelets and locket chain, coiffure of forget-me-nots and lilies of the valley, massed around a noble calla. This was all, yet even in this subdued attire she was divinely beautiful. Then what must she have been when adorned for the festival or the ball? All this time she had been busily chatting with Alonzo, unconscious of our inspection. The minutes still sped, and still she talked. But by and by she happened to look up and saw the clock. A crimson blush sent its rich flood through her cheeks, and she exclaimed, "'There! Good-bye, Mr. Fitzclarence! I must go now!' She sprang from her chair with such haste that she hardly heard the young man's answering good-bye. She stood radiant, graceful, beautiful, and gazed, wondering upon the accusing clock. Presently her pouting lips parted, and she said, Five minutes after eleven! nearly two hours, and it did not seem twenty minutes. Oh, dear, what will he think of me? At the selfsame moment Alonzo was staring at his clock, and presently he said, Twenty-five minutes to three, nearly two hours, and I didn't believe it was two minutes. Is it possible that this clock is humbugging again? Miss Ethelton, just one moment, please. Are you there yet? Yes, but be quick. I'm going right away. "'Would you be so kind as to tell me what time it is?' The girl blushed again, murmured to herself, "'It's right down cruel of him to ask me,' and then spoke up and answered with admirably counterfeited unconcern, Five minutes after eleven. "'Oh, thank you. You have to go now, have you?' "'I'm sorry.' No reply. "'Miss Ethelton, 
Well? You, you're there yet, ain't you? Yes, but please hurry. What did you want to say? Well, I, nothing in particular. It's very lonesome here. It's asking a great deal, I know, but would you mind talking with me again by and by? That is, if it will not trouble you too much? I don't know, but I'll think about it. I'll try. Ah, uh, thanks, Miss Ethelton. Ah, uh, me, she's gone. And here are the black clouds and the whirling snow and the raging winds come again. But she said good-bye. She didn't say good morning. She said good-bye. The clock was right, after all. What a lightning-winged two hours it was. He sat down and gazed dreamily into his fire for a while, then heaved a sigh and said, How wonderful it is! Two little hours ago I was a free man, and now my heart's in San Francisco. About that time, Rosanna Ethelton, propped in the window seat of her bedchamber, book in hand, was gazing vacantly out over the rainy seas that washed the Golden Gate, and whispering to herself, How different he is from poor Burley, with his empty head and his single little antic talent of mimicry. 2. Four weeks later, Mr. Sidney Algernon Burley was entertaining a gay luncheon company in a sumptuous drawing-room on Telegraph Hill, with some capital imitations of the voices and gestures of certain popular actors and San Franciscan literary people and bonanza grandees. He was elegantly upholstered, and was a handsome fellow, barring a trifling cast in his eye. He seemed very jovial, but nevertheless he kept his eye on the door with an expectant and uneasy watchfulness. By and by a knobby lackey appeared and delivered a message to the mistress, who nodded her head understandingly. That seemed to settle the thing for Mr. Burley. His vivacity decreased little by little, and a dejected look began to creep into one of his eyes, and a sinister one into the other. The rest of the company departed in due time, leaving him with the mistress, to whom he said, "'There is no longer any question about it. She avoids me. She continually excuses herself. If I could see her, if I could speak to her only a moment, but this suspense. Perhaps her seeming avoidance is mere accident, Mr. Burley. Go to the small drawing-room upstairs and amuse yourself a moment. I will dispatch a household order that is on my mind, and then I will go to her room. Without doubt she will be persuaded to see you. Mr. Burley went upstairs, intending to go to the small drawing-room, but as he was passing Aunt Susan's private parlour, the door of which stood slightly ajar, he heard a joyous laugh which he recognized. So, without knock or announcement, he stepped confidently in, but before he could make his presence known, he heard words that harrowed up his soul and chilled his young blood. He heard a voice say, "'Darling, it is come!' Then he heard Rosanna Ethelton, whose back was toward him, say, "'So has yours, dearest!' He saw her bowed form bend lower. He heard her kiss something, not merely once, but again and again. His soul raged within him. The heartbreaking conversation went on. "'Rosanna, I knew you must be beautiful, but this is dazzling, this is blinding, this is intoxicating. "'Alonzo, it is such happiness to hear you say it. I know it is not true, but I am so grateful to have you think it is nevertheless. I knew you must have a noble face.' but the grace and the majesty of the reality beggar the poor creation of my fancy. Burley heard that rattling shower of kisses again. Thank you, my Rosanna. The photograph flatters me, but you must not allow yourself to think of that. Sweetheart. Yes, Alonzo. I am so happy, Rosanna. Oh, Alonzo, none that have gone before me knew what love was. None that come after me will ever know what happiness is. I float in a gorgeous cloud land, a boundless firmament of enchanted and bewildering ecstasy. Oh, my Rosanna, you are mine, are you not? Holy, oh, holy yours, Alonzo, now and for ever. All the day long and all through my nightly dreams one song sings itself, and its sweet burden is, Alonzo Fitzclarence, Alonzo Fitzclarence, Eastport, State of Maine. Curse him! "'I've got his address, anyway,' roared Burley inwardly, and rushed from the place. Just behind the unconscious Alonzo stood his mother, a picture of astonishment. She was so muffled from head to heel in furs that nothing of herself was visible but her eyes and nose. She was a good allegory of winter, for she was powdered all over with snow. Behind the unconscious Rosanna stood Aunt Susan, another picture of astonishment. She was a good allegory of summer, for she was lightly clad and was vigorously cooling the perspiration on her face with a fan. Both of these women had tears of joy in their eyes. 
"'So, ho!' exclaimed Mrs. Fitzclarence. "'This explains why nobody has been able to drag you out of your room for six weeks, Alonzo.' "'So, ho!' exclaimed Aunt Susan. "'This explains why you have been a hermit for the past six weeks, Rosanna.' The young couple were on their feet in an instant, abashed and standing like detected dealers in stolen goods, awaiting Judge Lynch's doom. "'Bless you, my son. I am happy in your happiness. Come to your mother's arms, Alonzo.' "'Bless you, Rosanna. For my dear nephew's sake, come to my arms.' Then there was a mingling of hearts and of tears of rejoicing on Telegraph Hill and in Eastport Square. Servants were called by the elders in both places, until one was given the order— "'Pile this fire high with hickory wood, and bring me a roasting hot lemonade.' Unto the other was given the order, "'Put out this fire, and bring me two palm-leaf fans, and a pitcher of ice-water.' Then the young people were dismissed, and the elders sat down to talk the sweet surprise over, and make the wedding plans. Some minutes before this, Mr. Burley rushed from the mansion on Telegraph Hill, without meeting or taking formal leave of anybody. He hissed through his teeth in unconscious imitation of a popular favorite in melodrama. Him shall she never wed, I have sworn it, ere great nature shall have doffed her winter's ermine to don the emerald gods of spring, she shall be mine. 3. Two weeks later, every few hours during some three or four days, a very prim and devout-looking Episcopal clergyman with a cast in his eye had visited Alonzo. According to his card, he was the Reverend Melton Hargrave of Cincinnati. He said he had retired from the ministry on account of his health. If he had said on account of ill health, he would probably have erred to judge by his wholesome looks and firm build. He was the inventor of an improvement in telephones, and hoped to make his bread by selling the privilege of using it. At present, he continued, a man may go and tap a telegraph wire which is conveying a song or a concert from one state to another, and he can attach his private telephone and steal a hearing of that music as it passes along. My invention will stop all that." Well, answered Alonzo, if the owner of the music could not miss what was stolen, why should he care? He shouldn't care, said the reverend. Well, said Alonzo inquiringly, suppose, replied the reverend, suppose that instead of music that was passing along and being stolen, the burden of the wire was loving endearments of the most private and sacred nature. Alonzo shuddered from head to heel. Sir, it is a priceless invention, said he. I must have it at any cost. But the invention was delayed somewhere on the road from Cincinnati, most unaccountably. The impatient Alonzo could hardly wait. The thought of Rosanna's sweet words being shared with him by some ribald thief was galling to him. The reverend came frequently and lamented the delay and told of measures he had taken to hurry things up. This was some little comfort to Alonzo. One forenoon the reverend ascended the stairs and knocked at Alonzo's door. There was no response. He entered glanced eagerly around, closed the door softly, then ran to the telephone. The exquisitely soft and remote strains of the sweet by-and-by -by came floating through the instrument. The singer was flatting, as usual, the five notes that follow the first two in the chorus, when the reverend interrupted her with this word, in a voice which was an exact imitation of Alonzo's, with just the faintest flavor of impatience added, "'Sweetheart!' "'Yes, Alonzo. "'Please don't sing that any more this week. "'Try something modern.' The agile step that goes with a happy heart was heard on the stairs, and the reverend, smiling diabolically, sought sudden refuge behind the heavy folds of the velvet window curtains. Alonzo entered and flew to the telephone. Said he, "'Rosanna, dear, shall we sing something together?' "'Something modern?' asked she with sarcastic bitterness. "'Yes, if you prefer. Sing it yourself, if you like.' This snappishness amazed and wounded the young man. He said, "'Rosanna!' "'That was not like you. "'I suppose it becomes me, "'as much as your very polite speech "'became you, Mr. Fitzclarence. "'Mr. Fitzclarence? "'Rosanna, there was nothing impolite about my speech. "'Oh, indeed, of course, then I misunderstood you, "'and I most humbly beg your pardon. "'Ha, ha, ha! "'No doubt you said, don't sing it any more today. "'Sing what any more today? "'The song you mentioned, of course. "'How very obtuse we are all of a sudden. "'I never mentioned any song.' "'Oh, you didn't?' "'No, I didn't. "'I am compelled to remark that you did. "'And I am obliged to reiterate that I didn't. "'A second rudeness. "'That is sufficient, sir. "'I will never forgive you. "'All is over between us.' "'Then came a muffled sound of crying. "'Alonzo hastened to say, "'Oh, Rosanna, unsay those words. 
There is some dreadful mystery here, some hideous mistake. I am utterly earnest and sincere when I say I never said anything about any song. I would not hurt you for the whole world. Rosanna, dear, speak to me, won't you? There was a pause. Then Alonzo heard the girl's sobbings retreating, and knew she had gone from the telephone. He rose with a heavy sigh, and hastened from the room, saying to himself, I will ransack the charity missions in the haunts of the poor for my mother. She will persuade her that I never meant to wound her. A minute later, the Reverend was crouching over the telephone like a cat that knoweth the ways of the prey. He had not very many minutes to wait. A soft, repentant voice, tremulous with tears, said, "'Alonzo, dear, I have been wrong. You could not have said so cruel a thing. It must have been someone who imitated your voice in malice or in jest.' The Reverend coldly answered in Alonzo's tones, "'You have said it was all over between us, so let it be. I spurn your proffered repentance and despise it.' Then he departed, radiant with fiendish triumph, to return no more with his imaginary telephonic invention forever. Four hours afterward, Alonzo arrived with his mother from her favorite haunts of poverty and vice. They summoned the San Francisco household, but there was no reply. They waited and continued to wait upon the voiceless telephone. At length, when it was sunset in San Francisco, and three hours and a half after dark in Eastport, an answer to the oft-repeated cry of, Rosanna! But alas, it was Aunt Susan's voice that spake. She said, I have been out all day, just got in. I will go and find her. The watchers waited two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Then came these fatal words in a frightened tone. She is gone, and her baggage with her, to visit another friend, she told the servants. But I found this note on the table in her room. Listen. I am gone. Seek not to trace me out. My heart is broken. You will never see me more. Tell him I shall always think of him when I sing my sweet by and by, but never of the unkind words he said about it. That is her note. Alonzo, Alonzo, what does it mean? What has happened? But Alonzo sat white and cold as the dead. His mother threw back the velvet curtains and opened a window. The cold air refreshed the sufferer, and he told his aunt his dismal story. Meantime his mother was inspecting a card which had disclosed itself upon the floor when she cast the curtains back. It read, Mr. Sidney Algernon Burley, San Francisco. "'The miscreant!' shouted Alonzo, and rushed forth to seek the false reverend and destroy him, for the card explained everything, since in the course of the lovers' mutual confessions they had told each other all about all the sweethearts they had ever had, and thrown no end of mud at their failings and foibles, for lovers always do that. It has a fascination that ranks next after billing and cooing. 4. During the next two months many things happened. It had early transpired that Rosanna, poor suffering orphan, had neither returned to her grandmother in Portland, Oregon, nor sent any word to her save a duplicate of the woeful note she had left in the mansion on Telegraph Hill. Whosoever was sheltering her, if she was still alive, had been persuaded not to betray her whereabouts without doubt, for all efforts to find trace of her had failed. Did Alonzo give her up? Not he. He said to himself, She will sing that sweet song when she is sad. I shall find her. So he took his carpet sack and a portable telephone and shook the snow of his native city from his arctics and went forth into the world. He wandered far and wide in many states. Time and again strangers were astonished to see a wasted, pale, and woe-worn man laboriously climb a telegraph pole in wintry and lonely places, perch sadly there an hour with his ear at a little box, then come sighing down and wander wearily away. Sometimes they shot at him, as peasants do at aeronauts, thinking him mad and dangerous. Thus his clothes were much shredded by bullets, and his person grievously lacerated. But he bore it all patiently. In the beginning of his pilgrimage he used to say, Ah, if I could but hear the sweet by and by. But toward the end of it he used to shed tears of anguish and say, Ah, if I could but hear something else. Thus a month and three weeks drifted by, and at last some humane people seized him and confined him in a private madhouse in New York. He made no moan, for his strength was all gone, and with it all heart and all hope. The superintendent in pity gave up his own comfortable parlor and bedchamber to him, and nursed him with affectionate devotion. At the end of a week the patient was able to leave his bed for the first time. He was lying comfortably pillowed on a sofa, listening to the plaintive miserere of the bleak March winds and the muffled sound of tramping feet in the street below, for it was about six in the evening, and New York was going home from work. He had a bright fire, and the added cheer of a couple of student lamps. 
so it was warm and snug within, though bleak and raw without. It was light and bright within, though outside it was as dark and dreary as if the world had been lit with Hartford gas. Alonzo smiled feebly to think how his loving vagaries had made him a maniac in the eyes of the world, and was proceeding to pursue his line of thought further, when a faint, sweet strain, the very ghost of sound, so remote and attenuated it seemed, struck upon his ear. His pulses stood still. He listened with parted lips and bated breath. The song flowed on. He waited, listening, rising slowly and unconsciously from his recumbent position. At last he exclaimed, "'It is she! It is she! Oh, the divine hated notes!' He dragged himself eagerly to the corner whence the sounds proceeded, tore aside a curtain, and discovered a telephone. He bent over, and as the last note died away, he burst forthwith the exclamation, "'Oh, thank heaven! Found at last! Speak to me, Rosanna, dearest! The cruel mystery has been unraveled! It was the villain Burley who mimicked my voice and wounded you with insolent speech!' There was a breathless pause, a waiting age to Alonzo. Then a faint sound came, framing itself into language. Oh, say those precious words again, Alonzo. They are the truth, the veritable truth, my Rosanna, and you shall have the proof, ample and abundant proof. Oh, Alonzo, stay by me. Leave me not for a moment. Let me feel that you are near me. Tell me we shall never be parted more. Oh, this happy hour, this blessed hour, this memorable hour. We will make record of it, my Rosanna, every year, as this dear hour chimes from the clock. We will celebrate it with thanksgivings all the years of our life. We will, we will, Alonzo. Four minutes after six in the evening, my Rosanna, shall henceforth, twenty-three minutes after twelve, afternoon, shall. Why, Rosanna, darling, where are you? In Honolulu, Sandwich Islands. And where are you? Stay by me. Do not leave me for a moment. I cannot bear it. Are you at home? No, dear, I am in New York, a patient in the doctor's hands. An agonizing shriek came buzzing to Alonzo's ear, like the sharp buzzing of a hurt gnat. It lost power in traveling five thousand miles. Alonzo hastened to say, Calm yourself, my child. It is nothing. Already I am getting well under the sweet healing of your presence. Rosanna? Yes, Alonzo. Oh, how you terrified me. Say on. Name the happy day, Rosanna. There was a little pause. Then a diffident small voice replied, I blush. "'But it is with pleasure. It is with happiness. Would, "'Would you like to have it soon?' "'This very night, Rosanna. "'Oh, let us risk no more delays. "'Let it be now, this very night, this very moment. "'Oh, you impatient creature! "'I have nobody here but my good old uncle, "'a missionary for a generation, "'and now retired from service. "'Nobody but him and his wife. "'I would so dearly like it if your mother and your Aunt Susan— "'Our mother and our Aunt Susan, my Rosanna.' "'Yes, our mother, and our Aunt Susan. "'I am content to word it so, if it pleases you. "'I would so like to have them present.' "'So would I. "'Suppose you telegraph Aunt Susan. "'How long would it take her to come?' "'The steamer leaves San Francisco day after tomorrow. "'The passage is eight days. "'She would be here the 31st of March. "'Then name the 1st of April. "'Do, Rosanna, dear. "'Mercy! "'It would make us April fools, Alonzo.' So we be the happiest ones that that day's suit looks down upon in the whole broad expanse of the globe. Why need we care? Call it the first of April, dear. Then the first of April it shall be, with all my heart. Oh, happiness, name the hour, too, Rosanna. I like the morning. It is so blithe. Will eight in the morning do, Alonzo? The loveliest hour in the day, since it will make you mine. There was a feeble but frantic sound for some little time, as if wool-upped disembodied spirits were exchanging kisses. Then Rosanna said, "'Excuse me just a moment, dear. I have an appointment, and am called to meet it.' The young girl sought a large parlour, and took her place at a window which looked out upon a beautiful scene. To the left one could view the charming New Uana Valley, fringed with its ruddy flush of tropical flowers, and its plumed and graceful cocoa-palms, its rising foothills clothed in the shining green of lemon, citron, and orange groves, its storied precipice beyond, where the first Kamehameha drove his defeated foes over to their destruction, a spot that had forgotten its grim history, no doubt, for now it was smiling, as almost always at noonday, under the glowing arches of a succession of rainbows. 
In front of the window one could see the quaint town, and here and there a picturesque group of dusky natives enjoying the blistering weather, and far to the right lay the restless ocean tossing its white mane in the sunshine. Rosanna stood there in her filmy white raiment, fanning her flushed and heated face waiting. A Kanaka boy, clothed in a damaged blue necktie and part of a silk hat, thrust his head in at the door and announced, "'Frisco Howley!' "'Show him in,' said the girl, straightening herself up and assuming a meaning dignity. Mr. Sidney Algernon Burley entered, clad from head to heel in dazzling snow, that is to say, in the lightest and whitest of Irish linen. He moved eagerly forward, but the girl made a gesture and gave him a look which checked him suddenly. She said coldly, "'I am here, as I promised. I believe your assertions. I yielded to your importune lies, and said I would name the day. I named the first of April.' eight in the morning. Now go. Oh, my dearest, if the gratitude of a lifetime— Not a word. Spare me all sight of you, all communication with you until that hour. No, no supplications. I will have it so. When he was gone, she sank exhausted in a chair, for the long siege of trouble she had undergone had wasted her strength. Presently she said, What a narrow escape! If the hour appointed had been an hour earlier— Oh, horror, what an escape I have made! And to think I had come to imagine I was loving this beguiling, this truthless, this treacherous monster. Oh, he shall repent his villainy. Let us now draw this history to a close, for little more needs to be told. On the 2nd of the ensuing April, the Honolulu Advertiser contained this notice. Married, in this city by telephone, yesterday morning at 8 o'clock by Rev. Nathan Hayes, assisted by Rev. Nathaniel Davis of New York. Mr. Alonzo Fitzclarence of Eastport, Maine, U.S., and Miss Rosanna Ethelton of Portland, Oregon, U.S. Mrs. Susan Howland of San Francisco, a friend of the bride, was present, she being the guest of the Reverend Mr. Hayes and wife, uncle and aunt of the bride. Mr. Sidney Algernon Burley of San Francisco was also present, but did not remain till the conclusion of the marriage service. Captain Hawthorne's beautiful yacht, tastefully decorated, was in waiting, and the happy bride and her friends immediately departed on a bridal trip to Lahaina and Halakalea. The New York papers of the same date contained this notice. Married. In this city yesterday by telephone at half-past two in the morning by Rev. Nathaniel Davis, assisted by Rev. Nathan Hayes of Honolulu, Mr. Alonzo Fitzclarence of Eastport, Maine, and Miss Rosanna Ethelton of Portland, Oregon. The parents and several friends of the bridegroom were present and enjoyed a sumptuous breakfast and much festivity until nearly sunrise, and then departed on a bridal trip to the aquarium, the bridegroom's state of health not admitting of a more extended journey. Toward the close of that memorable day, Mr. and Mrs. Alonzo Fitzclarence were buried in sweet converse, concerning the pleasures of their several bridal tours, when suddenly the young wife exclaimed, "'Oh, Lonnie, I forgot. I did what I said I would.' "'Did you, dear?' "'Indeed I did. I made him the April fool, and I told him so, too. Ah, it was a charming surprise. There he stood, sweltering in a black dress suit, with the mercury leaking out of the top of the thermometer, waiting to be married.' You should have seen the look he gave when I whispered it in his ear. Ah, his wickedness cost me many a heartache and many a tear, but the score was all squared up then. So the vengeful feeling went right out of my heart, and I begged him to stay, and said I forgave him everything. But he wouldn't. He said he would live to be avenged, said he would make our lives a curse to us. But he can't, can he, dear? Never in this world, my Rosanna. Aunt Susan. The Oregonian grandmother and the young couple and their Eastport parents are all happy at this writing, and likely to remain so. Aunt Susan brought the bride from the islands, accompanied her across our continent, and had the happiness of witnessing the rapturous meeting between an adoring husband and wife who had never seen each other until that moment. A word about the wretched Burley, whose wicked machinations came so near wrecking the hearts and lives of our poor young friends will be sufficient. In a murderous attempt, to seize a crippled and helpless artisan who he fancied had done him some small offence, he fell into a cauldron of boiling oil and expired before he could be extinguished. End of the Loves of Alonzo Fitzclarence and Rosanna Ethelton Recording by John Letton, Van Nuys